This sounded great. This was convenient. This was a game changer. Hello and welcome again to the darkened room of music conversation. I'm Chris. And I'm Darren, and today we're going to be covering a topic that I've been so looking forward to. We're going to talk about the advent of the compact disc. We just passed a milestone in the history of the compact disc, the 38th, can you believe it? The 38th, it sounds weird saying it, the 38th anniversary of the release. Man, of, I'm getting old. I uh, know, man. It's just, uh, it's just crazy to even say that, especially yeah. when you remember when it came out. But yeah, mm -hmm. October 1st of 1982. Uh, was when it was unleashed upon the world, first in Japan, uh, soon made its way overseas uh, before too much longer after that. And we're going to cover a lot of stuff in this episode and uh, a lot of history, and we're going to try to provide you with accurate information. There's a lot of misinformation out here regarding the compact disc and certain dates and things, and we're going to try our best to get it right. Yeah, and uh, some of this stuff is going to be kind of technical. Uh, stick with us. Yeah. Try not to get bored because this is, you know, it's cool to know this stuff. It's it, like fascinating facts. It is, and as far as like the actual specs and stuff and, and the inner workings of the technology, we're not going to cover a whole lot of that. If you mm. want to learn about that there's plenty of things on the internet on youtube other things you can watch and yeah. learn about that so we're going to try to stick to the basics and the things that you probably do care about which is the music now one of the trivia things that's out there and i hear this all the time is that the very first commercially released cd ever was billy joel 52nd street all right so that's it and show the disc inside there too right. now here's the thing about that uh, the reason it's considered or thought of as the first commercially available CD is that its catalog number, and it did come out the very first day on October 1st, 1982. The catalog number is 35DP1. Let's see if we can get everyone to see that yeah. there. Uh, it's not going to focus. All right. Yeah. No big Close deal. enough. 35DP1. Yeah. And that 35 in that catalog number stood for 3,500 yen. Uh, at the time... I want to say CDs were, were roughly 13 US dollars or something, but that would convert to about $33 in today's money. Yeah. Uh, so quite an investment for 1982. Indeed. Now, even though that's thought of as the first uh, title ever available, it really is one of a batch of titles that was released on that first date. Now, think of how silly it would have been to go through all this trouble, mm -hmm. make these CD players and have one title available. You know that that didn't happen. But yeah. because it has the that... The new CD player's out, but if you're, you have to be a Billy Joel fan if you want one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so what they did, these were titles that were released exclusively in Japan on that first day. So mm -hmm. what Japan did was they, um, they actually had titles that were uh, popular in Japan. The American artists that they liked a lot, they also had Japanese pop titles that were released that day, as well as classical titles. Uh, we're going to go through a few of them that were uh, American titles, because I have them. The mm -hmm. second um, in the series, 35 DP2, was Billy Joel, The Stranger. So there it is right there. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of these, I'll just kind of fly through them. These were released the same day, on the very first day of release, uh, Boss Gags, Middleman. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have it in that series, but Pink Floyd... Wish You Were Here was released that day. It's yeah. very valuable if you find it. Uh, also, there was a Toto Turn Back. Mm -hmm. There's one right there. Yep. Uh, there was Journey Escape. Mm -hmm. There we go. Popular title in the USA. Yep. Uh, Barbara Streisand Guilty. I don't think I have that one with me. I do own it. Mm -hmm. uh, Weather Report uh, came out Night Passage on mm -hmm. the first day of release. Now, show that particular disc because okay. I want people to see this. The very first pressings that came out uh, very early on, had a gold tint. Do you see that right there? Can you see that in the camera? Yeah, you can kind of see it. Looks pretty yeah. good. Mm -hmm. All right, so you'll know that you have an original, original first press from Japan if the uh, tint is gold when you hold it in the light like that one. So uh, there were other titles that came out that day too as well. Ario Speedwagon was one for uh, one there. Yep, High mm -hmm. Infidelity, mm -hmm. which is nice. And um, Michael Jackson Off the Wall, a lot of stuff that came out on that first day of release. So there was like roughly 50 
um, pop titles that were released on the first day. You warned me of the slickness of these because they had them yeah, yeah, they polished had, and all that. And that that's right. That, and that's something else. If you can hold that up to... Mm -hmm. um, See, to there's the no to. grooving on the edges of these. <laughs> ribbed. <laughs> yeah, they're not They're not ribbed. They, were, they, had, they called them smooth tops at the time. And they found out early on that because the tops are this much... Nerd alert, nerd alert. Uh, eh, because eh. The, the tops <laughs> were smooth, that when you reached in your rack to grab them, your fingers would just slide off of them. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. why they put the ribs in there to make it easily um, where you could pull it out if mm -hmm. they were lined up like record albums. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so those are all titles that were released on the very first day. All right, so we had CDs. We had to have something to play them on. Mm -hmm. So the very first CD player that ever hit the market, the only player that was available on that day um, on October 1st, 1982, was this player right here, uh, which is a Sony CDP-101. The 101 is a reference to the ones and zeros that the laser reads. Once again, if you want to learn all about the inner workings of the technology and stuff, we're not going to cover that here. We know it, but we'll run people off with boredom, so we don't want to do that. But that's yeah, where... I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> no, stay. <laughs> uh, but but that's uh, what the 101 was referencing. Uh, this CD player on day of release was 730 US dollars for this player right here. Well, around the same time, now that you know, think about what 730 dollars would be worth in today's money. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it was a big investment at the mm. time. But this thing's built like a tank. It's very heavy. Still works flawlessly. And, um, and not long after that, Philips released their model, which was this right here. This is a CD100. It wasn't quite ready on day of release. So it was like maybe a month or a few weeks uh, later, and it retailed for over $700 as well. Yeah. So those were the only two players that were available the first uh, year or so um, that CDs were available. All right, and as far as pressing plants were concerned, Initially, there were only two places that, that CDs were pressed, and that would have been in Hanover. Is that how you say it? Hanover, uh, mm -hmm. West Germany? Um, and Philips, which at the time owned Polygram, they had a pressing plant there. So they were pressing up CDs. And of course, in Tokyo, Japan, the home of Sony, they also had a pressing plant. So early on, no matter where you were in the world, if you wanted to get CDs, you would have to have them imported from one of those two places. Uh, so that continued for... The, roughly the first two, two and a half years until finally in 1984, they opened the very first pressing plant in the United States in, I believe it was Terry Ho, Indiana. Um, and it was called the DADC uh, pressing plant. And uh, the very first title that was ever pressed up, guess what it was? This is pretty interesting, especially because of the title. So think 1984 and what was really, really I'm going to take a stab and right. say it was Born in the USA. That's exactly right. Born yeah. in the USA was the very first title that they ever pressed up at that plant. Very nice. Yeah, so that yeah. that's uh, that's some accurate trivia yeah. uh, for you there. Now, the one other thing I was going to kind of clear up, uh, it's been said, it's kind of folklore, it's kind of like a romantic tale out there, that the CD was 74 minutes long because the president of Sony wanted to be able to listen to a continuous version of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Well, that's never really been confirmed. In fact, the people that were working on the technology then said it's flat out not true. Hmm. They were actually working to increase the diameter of the disc to get more information on there. And the truth was, at the time that CDs came out, the early ones, uh, in, in 1982, they were only capable of holding 72 minutes of music anyway. And it had way more to do with actually the size, the circumference of the CD matching the diameter of a cassette. Now, Chris is going to demonstrate this for you right here. There See there? Go. It's basically the same Pretty size. the same size, yeah. Right. So that was really, it had more to do with that than it did... Um, you know, the, the romantic tale. Fun to talk about on a rainy day and mm -hmm. nice to romanticize about how the, the president, the big boss man said, hey, you got to do it this way. But that really does not appear to be the case. Right. So I wanted to clear that up. You'll see a lot of, you'll see that everywhere. I, I, I read that tale every year on the anniversary of the CD. So um, that's never been substantiated. All right. So speaking of 1984, yeah. 
Um, isn't that about the time that the uh, Sony Walkman disc player came out? It absolutely is. That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, the D50 came out in 1984, and it was 350 US dollars for this thing. And uh, and I think it it actually has held its value. I see if you got one in good shape these days, you can get more money than that for them. Mm. And uh, they were built like little tanks. They were really good, but they're very important because that introduced the market into the portable realm, mm -hmm. which you know just created more interest. Um, the public was like, "Hey, this is something I might could get into." You know, yeah. Very similarly to the the Walkman cassette that Sony put out there, that was a real game changer. It was, and uh, and and likewise. With the um, the discman, they called it the Sony discman. Mm -hmm. It had very much the same effect on uh, cons uh, consumers. So yeah, that, yeah, that's a good point. All right, so <clears throat> we already mentioned that the the only two pressing plants initially were either in West Germany or Sony. Mm -hmm. So as the demand was rising for CDs in uh, places like the United States, mm -hmm. we had to have those imported from there. So a lot of the American companies, uh, even after the um, DADC plant in Terry Ho uh, was up and running, the demand of CDs were so much that they still had to outsource a lot of uh, the titles in here just to meet the demands. So I want to demonstrate a couple of early, now what? hold that up and show that to the camera there. And what is that called there, my friend? That would be called a Target CD. That is exactly right. And the reason it's called a Target CD is it looks like it's got a little crosshairs, like you're mm -hmm. looking through the scope of a gun. Right. So they uh, they called those Target CDs. Now, that particular one that he just showed you there was Fleetwood Mac Rumors. Mm -hmm. That was the West German pressing uh, for the United States. So that was imported in. Also, that same title, we're going to show you this one right here. Uh, this is a Target pressing from Japan, the Japan for uh, USA version that was imported in. And um, you see the difference there. They're both got the Target design, but one's from West Germany and one's from Japan. Now, notice that in the center, the hub yeah, on the ones. The difference on that. Yeah. People missed it. Yeah. The, the hub of the ones pressed in West Germany were full aluminum all the way to the center. The ones in so, uh, in Japan from Tokyo that were pressed up had a plastic ring in the mm -hmm. center. So that's one difference between the two pressing plants. If you're out there in the wild and you're looking to collect these things, it kind of, you know, even without reading on the disc itself where it was manufactured, that's one thing that gives it away. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, as the demand increased, you know, the uh, manufacturers were importing titles from Japan for the USA market, and they started to share catalog numbers if you know what you're looking for. This particular title by Pink Floyd right here, if you look, and you're not going to be able to see it in this camera, uh, but the matrix code that's in the actual center hub has the same catalog number, 35DP4, as the original Japan for Japan pressing that was out on the very first day of release. It also has the same mastering. Anytime you see that same code, it's gonna sound identical to the one that was pressed in Japan. Same thing with this title right here by Journey Escape. You won't be able to see it. Uh, you'll see it on the bottom perimeter there, it does say made uh, in Japan or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that code, the hub, the matrix in the center will also say 35 DP6. Um, the title here, Michael Jackson Thriller, which, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was released sometime in October of '82. So it was after the initial release of CDs. Um, it didn't. It didn't hit the first day. I have to look that up to be sure, but I'm pretty sure about that. Okay. Um, it, it was pretty quick uh, and early in the uh, release department as far as uh, CDs go from Japan. And then finally, I want to demonstrate this right here because this is really cool. The very first CD that ever went platinum, that ever sold a million copies mm -hmm. in the United States was this title right here, Dire Straits, Brothers in Arms. Uh, open it up and show the uh, particular version. That's a full aluminum West German hub, oh, you will yes. see there, pressed in Hanover, Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, show the uh, long box, because I want to uh, touch on that a little bit, too. Right. Um, I have the original long box that this came in. Mm -hmm. There right. it is. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All right. so. We package them on the bottom and yeah. drop them out at the bottom. Most people threw them away. I'm the, I'm a nerd. I kept it. Um, now, why would they do this, Darren? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. That's a good question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, the reason they were this size initially 
is because of this right here, the vinyl record. They didn't want to put people to the trouble of having to uh, buy new racks or build mm -hmm. new racks. They wanted the CD to be able to be displayed in the same racks and bins that were made for the LP record. So there you go. You see that they're the same height. Mm -hmm. And um, grab those other two that I have there and hold right. them up. You'll see that if you have two CDs, and these are still sealed versions I have here of Don Henley and also Emmy Lou Harris in the long box. Mm -hmm. um, they are roughly the both of them together lined up or the same size as a vinyl record. Once again, uh, it was for shoplifting purposes. They didn't want people to be able to conceal them easily and steal them, but it had more to do with the racks that the LPs, marketing, the marketing exactly, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the racks that uh, that originally held vinyl. Mm -hmm. uh, it was for convenience. So uh, so there you go. Now you know uh, that lasted until and I was in music retail at the time mm -hmm. until roughly 1994 uh, is when uh, they decided that for environmental purposes that they would no longer produce the cardboard boxes mm -hmm. most people were just taking them and throwing them away anyway yeah it was just creating trash for no reason so then um, and I can tell you from experience I was in um, the the CD world in retail at that time, we had to unbox everything mm -hmm. and uh, and put them in in little CD holders so people couldn't steal them and all that stuff. So yeah. uh, anyway, uh, so that was what was happening. That happened in 1994. No more long box uh, except for a few like um, anniversary editions and stuff like this. Every now and then you'll see a long box, but mm -hmm. it's just more for novelty um, yeah. than anything else. And they know that. With novelty pressings, most people are going to keep the box. They're not going to throw it away, and it's going to be trash. Right. So, all right. So that kind of brings you up to speed from 82 uh, to 94. All right. By 1988, the CD sales had actually overtaken the LP for the first time. And it held on to that for decades. And by the early 90s, they were outselling cassettes. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, between 1983 and 1984... I found this to be a pretty big number. There were 400,000 CD players sold uh, in the U.S. alone in that one year. Wow. And um, and we're talking back then, the CD players were a minimum of $400 roughly mm -hmm. to, you know, could be $2,000 for certain uh, certain models. Yeah. So they were expensive. Um, like you said, in 84, when uh, the Discman came along and, you know, because people had invested so well early on in the expensive players the the price had uh, dropped the technology they kept creating like models that they could uh, they could sell in the retail market for less money people could afford them they really took off in the mid to late 80s so by 1988 CD sales had actually overtaken vinyl LPs which was right on track with what they wanted so they got a lot of stuff right uh, with how they planned this thing even though it was slow going in the beginning it took all the 70s uh, to develop the technology and stuff. By the time they rolled it out in 82, the plan was working. They, you know, they didn't have any kind of com competitive formats that was uh, fighting against uh, each other like you know, VHS and Beta. Uh, so the the list of titles that they had were, were really good. The, the demand of CDs and the titles that people wanted released was just crazy. And I don't know if you remember this, but at the time in you know, in our market in Nashville, mm -hmm. uh, on the radio, they would make a big deal. I remember that. When yeah. they were playing CDs. Everything we play is from Compact Disc. Right. Yeah, I remember them saying that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it was a big, it was a big deal. It really was. It was like nothing that that I'd ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and then that same year in 1988, there were 400 million CDs that were pressed up, and by that time, they had 50 pressing plants all around the world. So. Wow. From 1982 to 1988, this thing had really, really taken off. Now, I want to talk about, just for a second, I want to talk about our experiences with CDs initially. Mm -hmm. uh, the very first time that maybe you saw a CD, the very first time that I saw a CD, um, I'd heard about them. The first time I actually went and seen one was at a Kmart store in uh, Goodlettsville, Tennessee. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was in a glass case. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was like, wow, look at this. This is crazy. Uh, I have to have one. Uh, of course, there was a, there was an obstacle. I didn't have any money. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, I was, I, was a, I was a little kid. Uh, but I, um, 
was just mesmerized by it. And this probably would have been 86, maybe 87, mm. 85, somewhere around in there. Yeah. Not real sure. Uh, what about you? When was the first time you saw well, one? I saw one for the first time way before that. Okay. Uh, in all of all places, Midland, Texas. Midland, Texas. Wow. So that's where my, my dad is from. Yeah. And I would go visit my grandparents. And a friend <clears throat> of theirs had a son about my age. And I was over there. His dad worked for Texas Instruments, so he was a big techie kind of guy. Right. Uh, he had a CD player, and um, I don't even remember what year this was. It I would say it'd have to be like uh, 84 or somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. And it's before I'd seen them anywhere. Like, I remember seeing them in Sound Shop in the mall yeah. uh, under the glass. But, you know, I just rem remember how great that sounded. I was just blown and away. And what song was it? you remember? It, well, I don't remember the song, but it was yeah. hooked on classics. Gotcha. Uh, it was the first CD that I heard. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it, it, I was just blown away. Yeah. yeah. And, and the very first time I actually heard one, believe it or not, was the first CD that I ever owned. And I had actually asked for a CD player for, I think, the Christmas of 87. Mm -hmm. And so I had a player before I had any CDs. Yeah. And uh, and so I, um, a, a friend of mine who lived up the street from me, who's a friend of mine to this day, uh, shout out to Jason, what's up? Um, he had his player around the same time, maybe before me. Um, but uh, Or we got him around the same time, actually, now that I think about it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, every Saturday, he would go to the mall and go to the music store and buy stuff. So I gave him money, uh, and I wanted, the first two titles that I wanted was Steely Dan Decade and Journey Escape. And uh, when he went to the mall that day, nobody had Journey Escape. So he came back with uh, Steely Dan Decade and Journey Departure, ah. which was fun. I love that one too. So those were my first two. The first one I actually put in the player and listened to was Steely Dan. The track was FM, and I was like, wow, no static at all. For real, <laughs> nice, um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that was the very first time I'd ever heard a, a CD play. Was my own player in my little uh, uh, Emerson CD player of yeah. all things. Tell us about your first CD player. What was the first CD player? I bought there? mine in 1980, 1988. Actually. 1988, okay. Yeah, it was at the KDF uh, half price fair. Local radio station had a big. You know, at the Municipal Auditorium. Yeah. Had all kinds of vendors, and that's where I showed up. I paid about, I think it was about $350 that I paid for it. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That, and you still have it? Uh, I do. It's sitting right over there. Ah, yeah. Well, check that out. That day, you know, we stopped at Kmart, and I got my first two CDs, which was Robert Palmer's Riptide. Yeah. And Eddie Money... Um, can't hold back. Can't hold back. Nice. I always want to say can't slow down, but that's Lionel Richie. <laughs> I get those confused. Like <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I get Eddie Money and Lionel Richie confused. But, you know. It happens. It yeah. happens. Um, so the CD, as you could tell, it was well executed, well planned out. Uh, it, it did exactly what they expected it to do, exactly what they wanted it to do, which was replace the vinyl record. Mm -hmm. For a while, it did that very thing. There were some problems, though, by the end of the 90s. Uh, people started to. I, I t this is my own opinion. Doesn't have to be yours. I feel like people got tired of paying top dollar for albums that sucked, and having one or two songs that they liked. Uh, you know, the, it, it wasn't a good trade off to be spending fifteen, sixteen dollars a pop to, yeah. to like one song. It is true all throughout the nineties. <clears throat> record companies were actually withholding releasing singles yes. so you would buy the whole CD. so you would have to buy the whole CD and consumers got weary of that exactly and there were no other options really if you wanted it mm -hmm. uh, so unless you wanted to invest in a recordable CD player or something like that well then along came the internet long after that not long after that came yep. uh, Napster yep um, for those of you old enough to remember mm -hmm. and uh, and it really I'm talking immediately it was like a big knife carving a big chunk out of CD cells. Yeah, it crushed it. It really, yeah. really did. So by yeah. the by the, the early two thousands, it was not pretty. No, and by the late two thousand, let me get some facts here. I've got some yeah. uh, stats. See, in two thousand nine, CDs were still like selling pretty well. Yeah, but in twenty twelve. Uh, CDs and DVDs made up only 34% of music. They say DVDs there. I'm assuming that's because of the DVD audio format. Right. Uh, by 2015, we're talking just three years later, it had dropped to 24% wow. of music sales. Um, and Massive then, declines. You're right. And then in 2018, it had dropped down to the point that the amount of CDs sold was only 6% 
of what it was in 2000. Wow. That's yeah. a dramatic, dramatic drop. That's right. Right. And so for a while, the industry uh, really panicked. They didn't know what mm -hmm. to do. Um, and then, you know, this is a story for another day, but eventually yeah. streaming came along and stuff, and it kind of sorted itself out. Mm -hmm. um, but, hey, that is an overview of the CD, uh, how it came to be, kind of a, a, a brief history on um, uh, how it progressed. And, and, man, let me tell you, in its heyday, it was something else. And they mm -hmm. got a lot of things right, I will say. Looking back all these years later, um, it was a really good technology at the right time, still valid. CDs, you know, and another thing is people, um, you know, kind of trash the sound of CDs. They sound harsh and all this stuff. Mm. It, it has everything to do with the mastering. A CD yes. can sound absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got many that sound like crap. I have some that sound amazing. And hey, the fact that um, the price dropped and um, the value dropped and all that. Look at it like this. It's a buyer's market. If you want CDs, you can own damn near anything and it mm -hmm. won't bleed your bank account. Yeah. So, uh, so in that sense, it's good. And I will predict right here, I will predict right here, right now, uh -oh. at some point, there will be a revival in CDs just like there was vinyl records. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I'm not as optimi optimistic as you, but... Um We'll see. Well, it, I'll tell you why. I think that generations come along and they feel like they missed out on something. Mm -hmm. And then they get in. Like, who would have saw? I, I'm telling you. I, did you ever see Vinyl making a comeback? It, I'm talking about. I really, no, I really didn't. I didn't either. Yeah. And yet here we are. Yeah. So stranger things have happened. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this little brief history about uh, compact disc. And I learned some things. Yeah, and we tried to provide accurate information. Hopefully, we didn't bog it down with too much boring talk for you. Um, but uh, definitely let us know um, maybe your first CDs that you purchased and maybe the first time that you heard a CD. Um, yeah, drop it down in the comments. Thanks for watching this episode of In a Darkened Room. You can find the link to this episode's companion Spotify playlist in the description. Darren and Chris welcome your comments. You can leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments section below. Follow In a Darkened Room on Twitter to receive updates and submit your ideas for what we should discuss in upcoming episodes. Darren and Chris are also on Instagram, so give them a follow there as well. All of these links can be found in the description below. While you're there, be sure to click subscribe and ring the bell. All right, so here's where we do random topic times. And right. uh, this time around, we're going to do trivia from our trivia box. Right. So uh, I want you to start. All right. So I'm Take gonna, it out of the front. I'm going to draw a card, right? Draw a card, and right. we're going to test our knowledge. <clears throat> we, right. we, we act like that we know a lot about music and trivia and all that. Sometimes we can get stumped. So this box sure. has got some stumpers, and this box also has some stuff that... That's way too easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and sometimes if it's so easy and so obvious, I may discard it. Yeah. <laughs> Just because it's so, you know, we want to be at least challenged. And this is not staged at all. All right. All right. So here is the, the question of the day. What's the category there? The category is one hit wonders of the 80s. Ah. All right. You don't know anything about that, do you? I don't know anything about <laughs> this, man. I will bet my house and my truck that I will get this one right. Oh, yeah. And I don't even know what it is yet. All right. Uh, what was Danny Wilson's? Uh, only U.S. hit. And I know the answer. I is. know the answer to this, too. All right. Let's say it uh, together. Three, two, one. Mary's Prayer. Prayer. There you go. And that the, one uh, was easy. The choices were turn, turn in Japanese, uh, <laughs> run away, and come on, Eileen. Um, <laughs> so, yes, Mary's Prayer. I like that song a lot. And it's kind of it's kind of weird the way this worked out. Early on, um, Danny Wilson was compared to Steely Dan. Uh, the singer had a very, I can see that, yeah, very unique mm -hmm. voice, very Donald Fagan like, um, and I, they cited St Steely Dan as an influence. So mm -hmm. I like that song. I think it's a really great song, and um, I enjoy it when I hear it now. To this oh, very I do day. too. Yeah, I have it in a playlist on Spotify right now, and it's um, excellent. Yeah, it's a, a frequent rotation. All right, well, I maybe we'll it. get a tougher question next time. Maybe so. But that was good. That was fun. Well, man, this was a great episode. I had a uh, really, really good time doing this and talking about this. Yeah, this yeah, I'm that. loving this. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with this. And hopefully yeah. you guys will return again. We'll have another episode very soon. Absolutely. All that right. sounds great. Take Thank care, you. guys. Keep rocking.